Well, hello, everybody. It's good to see you once again. Uh, thank you for being with us. Um, I want to especially welcome those who are watching this presentation live on some TV. We're pleased that you've decided to join us. Uh, I would like to just mention that uh, this series that we're studying uh, is based on a syllabus that I prepared. It's 400 and paid, 405 pages of material uh, where you have a question and answer format. And uh, in the answer, you have to fill in blanks uh, to make sure that you're reading the text and that you're understanding what the text is saying. So I would encourage you to get a copy of the syllabus. Uh, the syllabus, uh, you know, has uh, 51 lessons that include analogies and parables and miracles that Jesus performed and the spiritual lessons that we can learn from uh, those particular teachings of Jesus. So uh, contact Secrets Unsealed at secretsunsealed.org and uh, you'll be able to get information on how to acquire a copy of this very important syllabus. Now, the lesson that we're going to study today is lesson number 37, the healing of the paralytic at Capernaum. But before we uh, read the passage that we're going to take a look at, we want to ask the Lord to be with us as we study. So I invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Father in heaven, we come before you this morning to thank you for the many blessings that you pour out upon us day in and day out. Things that we take for granted, food, shelter, clothing, the privilege of being your children. We especially at this moment thank you for your holy word, a sure guide in a world that is so confused, in a world that seems to be spinning out of control. Thank you for your word which gives us assurance in the midst of the storms and trials of life. We ask that as we study this very important lesson that your Holy Spirit will guide our thoughts and open our hearts that we might learn the lessons that will be beneficial to our personal walk with Jesus. Thank you, Father, for the privilege of prayer. Thank you for hearing and answering us. For we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to read the passage that we're going to take a look at in our study uh, during this hour. It's found in Mark chapter 2 and verses 1 through 12. Now, uh, this story is also found in the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of Luke. But we're going to take the story as it's told in the Gospel of Mark. I would encourage you to take a look at the parallel Gospels because those Gospels have additional uh, information that is not found in the passage in the Gospel of Mark. So I'm going to read from verses 1 through 12 of Mark chapter 2. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. And again, he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately many gathered together, so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. In other words, it was packed, the house was packed, even to the door, and even outside the door there were people. And he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, that is to Jesus, bringing a paralytic, who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Let's go now to verse 8. But immediately, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, Why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, arise, take up your bed and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately 
he arose, took up the bed, and went out in the presence of them all, so that all were amazed, and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. So that is the story that we're going to take a look at. And you might be saying, well, you know, this is just a story. This is just a miracle that Jesus performed. You know, he gave hope to this individual whose legs were paralyzed. But as we found in previous lessons, the miracles of Jesus also are parables. In other words, the miracles of Jesus have the purpose of teaching deep spiritual truth. So in this series of lessons, we have not only studied strictly the parables, We've also studied analogies, we've studied allegories, and we've studied miracles of Jesus because all of these teachings of Jesus embrace tremendous spiritual truths beyond the physical. Now let's go to the introduction of our lesson. This is on page 269 of our syllabus, lesson number 37. Introduction. In his public ministry, Jesus healed many paralytics. In the next two lessons, that is in this one and the next one, we will focus on the two most notorious healing, healings of paralytics. The healing of the paralytic in Capernaum, that's one, and the restoration of the paralytic by the pool of Bethesda, that's number two. Of course, that's John chapter 5. We will find in our study that these two episodes do not simply describe Christ's power to heal those who are physically maimed. In other words, we need to go beyond the physical healing. The physical healing uh, encloses great spiritual truth that we need to learn. I continue. They actually teach, seek to teach, that Jesus is able to heal those who are spiritually paralyzed by sin. In other words, the paralysis, the physical paralysis, represents the paralysis of sin in our lives. So let's go to the subsection, the paralytic's desperate plight. So let's see what condition this paralytic was in that is described in Mark chapter 2. Number one, how do we know that this man's physical paralysis was due to his sinful habits. So notice that there's a connection, there's a psychosomatic connection here between this man's physical illness and his spiritual condition. The answer is found in Mark chapter 2 and verse 5 and also Desire of Ages, page 267. It says there in Mark chapter 2 verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, that is the faith of those who brought him, we'll come back to that in a few moments, he said unto the sick of the palsy, in other words, unto the paralytic, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. So you'll notice that before Jesus heals the man physically, he tells him, your sins are forgiven you. This shows that there's a connection between this man's sinful life and the physical ailment that he was suffering. Now notice also Desire of Ages, page 267. It was to manifest His power to forgive sins that the miracle was performed. So notice, the purpose of the miracle was not only to heal a man of a physical paralysis. The miracles of Jesus were meant to teach profound spiritual truth. And of course, the lesson here was to manifest, to show that Jesus has power to forgive sins. This is why he performed this particular miracle. Let's go to question number two. What was the paralytic's state of mind when Jesus healed him? Desire of Ages, page 267, uh, tells us, like the leper, this pa and we studied the leper already, this paralytic had lost all hope of recovery. So his case was desperate. He said, there's no hope. I'll be a paralytic for the rest of my, life's, of my life due to the sins that I have committed. So like the leper, this paralytic had lost all hope of re recovery. His disease was the result of a life of sin. 
and his sufferings were embittered by remorse. So you'll notice he's not only suffering physical paralysis, he's also suffering deep remorse in his conscience because he knows that his physical ailment is called caused by spiritual sin in his life. And he basically has lost all hope. Let's read the note. Many people in the world today are in the same situation as the paralytic. Due to wrong physical habits, a life of sin, and cankering remorse, they have just about lost hope. Without God and without hope in the world. Number three, bottom of page 269. From whom had the paralytic sought help? And what was their response? So had this paralytic sought help elsewhere to, uh, during his lifetime? Well, we find the answer in Desire of Ages. And let's take a look and see what page it is. Desire of Ages, page 267. This is the bottom of page 269. He had long before appealed to the Pharisees and doctors, hoping for relief from mental suffering and physical pain. So in other words, he had gone to the religious experts of the day. He had gone to the ministers and to the theologians and to the medical doctors. And he had said, you know, please help me with my physical pain. Please help me with this remorse I feel over sin. Of course, they believed that it was his sin that caused God to make him physically sick. So, you know, they, they felt that God was punishing him for his sins. Uh, Desire of Ages 267 continues by telling us what the reaction of the religious leaders was. But they coldly pronounced him incurable and abandoned him to the wrath of God. So in other words, they said to him, you really are beyond hope. Your sins have caused this. God is manifesting His wrath against you. Your case is hopeless. You're in your sins. Not only are you going to suffer the rest of your life, but you are going to lose out on eternal life as well. A lot of encouragement from the spiritual leaders of the day. And of course, I'm speaking sarcastically. Top of page 270, number four. How much could the paralytic do for himself? Well, in Desire of Ages 267, we find this answer. The palsied man, in other words, the paralytic, was entirely helpless. And seeing no prospect of aid from any quarter, he had sunk into despair. In other words, in himself, he saw nothing good. He said, I'm a sinner. My sin has caused my physical ail ailment. God has forsaken me. His wrath is upon me. I have absolutely no hope. There's no help coming from anywhere. Let's read the note. The world is filled with people such as this paralytic. They have no power within themselves to remove their guilt and relieve their physical suffering. Their only hope is to receive help from a source outside themselves, from Jesus Christ. And that's the reason why God has called those who have embraced Christ to be witnesses to the world. We are to proclaim to the world that Jesus is the only hope. That in the midst of severe physical suffering, perhaps caused by, by spiritual sin in our lives, there is hope. Hope in looking unto Jesus to bring not only spiritual healing, but also physical healing as well. Now let's go to the next subsection, page 270, and the title of the subsection is Hope in Jesus. Number one, what gave the paralytic a glimmer of hope? Notice a glimmer. It's not saying that it gave, that it gave him a lot of hope. It gave him a little sliver, a little glimmer of hope. The answer is in Desire of Ages, page 267. Then he heard of the wonderful works of Jesus. He was told that others as sinful and helpless as he had been healed. Even lepers had been cleansed. 
So this man hears about Jesus, the testimony of others that say lepers are healed, paralytics are healed, uh, dead are raised from their graves. So he says, is there perhaps some hope for me? Number two, who encouraged the paralytic to seek out Jesus? Well, there were witnesses that brought him to Jesus, just like we are supposed to do. We are supposed to wear, bear witness to Jesus and bring others to the feet of Jesus, just like the Samaritan woman did, and just as the disciples were called to do. So the question is, who encouraged the paralytic to seek out Jesus? The answer, Desire of Ages, page 267. And the friends who reported these things, in other words, the friends were the ones that told him about Jesus, encouraged him to believe that he too might be cured if he could be carried to Jesus. In other words, they said, take courage, have faith and trust that Jesus can heal you. But now he's saying, how can I ever get to Jesus? Because I'm a paralytic. I can't walk. I can't go to where he is. The crowds and the multitudes are, are there. I can't get through. How can I get to him? Let's read the note. The paralytic could have ignored the counsel of his friends. He could have said, ah, it's useless. Yeah, he's healed lepers and he's healed paralytics, but there's really no hope for me. He could have given up. In the depths of his despair, he could have told them that he had lost hope. But he chose to listen to their counsel and to seek out Jesus. Now here's the, the main point. Frequently, good counsel from friends can lead desperate souls to the feet of Jesus. And that's what it's all about, folks. It's about witnessing to Jesus, bringing people to the feet of Jesus. That's what life is all about. You know, we find it, for example, in the case of the Samaritan woman. You know, uh, she uh, received salvation. She drank the water from the well of salvation. And immediately, what did she do? Immediately, she said, I can't contain this salvation that has come to my soul in my own heart. I have to share it. She had drunk of the water, and now she becomes a fountain of water. And we've studied this parable before which uh, it's a story, but it's actually a parable that teaches profound spiritual truth. She goes to Sikar, and from door to door she says, I found the Messiah, I found the Messiah. She, she goes to everyone in the city and says, come, let's go. I'll take you to him so that you can see for yourself. And so the entire town invites Jesus to come in. He spends two days in the town of Sikar, eating in their homes and witnessing to them about the gospel of the kingdom. So in other words, we are in this world to bring people to the feet of Jesus. If we don't feel like bringing people like to Jesus, perhaps it's because we have not come to Jesus ourselves. A very awesome and important thought. Now let's go uh, to number three. What was the paralytic's deepest fear? Desire of Ages 267. But his hope fell when he remembered how the disease had been brought upon him. He says, that's because of my sins that this disease came upon me. So is he going to pay any attention to a sinner? The religious leaders have told me that I'm suffering under the wrath of God. So this man cannot save me from the wrath of God. My case is beyond hope. The devil is trying to plant doubts in the, minds, in the mind of this paralytic. Uh, the statement in Desire of Ages 267 continues, but his hope fell when he remembered how the disease had been brought upon him. He feared that the pure physician would not tolerate him in his presence. In other words, this man is so holy, so righteous, that he would not even allow me to come into his presence because I am a vile sinner and I'm suffering the result of my sins. Let's read the note. Today, we're noticing all of the spiritual applications as we go along. Today, there are many who feel that they are too sinful to come to Jesus. But these are the very ones Jesus is attracting to himself. The Savior has made the immutable promise. This is John 6, verse 37. All that my Father giveth me shall come to me. 
and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. In other words, whoever comes to Jesus will never be cast out. Jesus, no matter how sinful the person is, will actually supply their desires and their needs. The bottom of page 270, number four. Was physical healing foremost in the paralytic's mind? In other words, did this uh, paralytic feel that Jesus was this great faith healer and he was especially concerned with having his legs restored so that he could walk physically? Was that his main concern? The answer is in Desire of Ages, page 267. Yet it was not physical restoration he desired so much as relief from the burden of sin. If he could see Jesus and receive the assurance of forgiveness and peace with heaven, interesting, he would be content to live or die according to God's will. In other words, he, he, he was saying, if I can just have peace in my soul, I don't really care whether I'm physically healed or not, because my physical problem is due to my sins. If I can just have peace in my soul, I'll be happy. Let's read the note. The paralytic's innermost desire stands in contrast to many of those who follow Jesus. Great multitudes often flocked to Jesus because they wished to be delivered from physical suffering. In fact, let's read uh, John chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. John chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, and find out why most of the multitudes follow Jesus. It says there in John chapter 6, After these things Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Then a great multitude followed Him, because they saw His signs, which He performed on those who were diseased. In other words, they saw Jesus as a great miracle worker. And uh, maybe I can make a parenthesis here. Is it just possible today that multitudes are following faith healers today, not primarily because they want Jesus to heal the, their sin-sick souls, but they desire to receive physical healing and the assurance of great prosperity in this life? You know, you have this movement in, in the world today where these television evangelists make millions of dollars. They live in million dollar homes and they have corporate jets and they're telling people to invest money in, in their ministry and uh, they're supposedly healing people that are sick and multitudes are following. Is it possible that they're going through the same experience as those that are mentioned here in John chapter 6 where we are told once again, then a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs which he performed on those who were diseased. And in John chapter 4, we find Jesus said, this, this generation, all they desire is to have signs and wonders. But they did not want healing of their heart from sin. So let's notice once again uh, this note. The paralytic's innermost desire stands in contrast to many of those who follow Jesus. Great multitudes often flock to Jesus because they wish to be delivered from physical suffering. John 6, 1 and 2, for example, explains that many follow Jesus because of the signs which He performed. And today many people look upon Jesus as a faith healer and not as a deliverer from the stroke of sin. Now let's notice uh, the next section uh, which is titled The Paralytic visits Jesus. So we've uh, found out what the paralytic feel, felt like. He had almost lost hope, but his friends tell him about Jesus. There's a glimmer of hope. He says, maybe he would be able to heal me. But then he says, oh no, I'm too sinful. This man is too holy. There's no way that he's going to look at somebody like me. But then his friends persuade him to be taken to Jesus. This is the next section. Number one, page 271. Who came up with the idea to take the paralytic to Jesus? Desire of Ages 267, He besought his friends, the same friends that witnessed to him, He besought his friends to carry him on his bed to Jesus, and this they gladly undertook to do. 
So the friends tell him, you know, we've heard that Jesus heals lepers and he raises the dead and he heals paralytics. You know, maybe he could do it for you. And the man says, yeah, but he's so holy and I'm so unrighteous. Would he pay any attention to me? So finally he says to his friends, okay, take me to him. Let's read the note. Though his friends, friends spoke to him about Jesus, this is important, the decision to visit the Lord was the paralytics. Our friends can encourage us to come to Jesus, but the decision to actually come must be ours. So when somebody witnesses to you about Jesus, don't reject what the person is saying. Say, yes, I will come to Jesus. I will go to Jesus. I believe that Jesus is able to save me. Let's go to number two, page 271. What type of audience was present when Jesus healed the paralytic? Desire of Ages, page 267. Outside of these officials thronged the promiscuous multitude, the eager, the reverent, the curious, and the unbelieving. <laughs> no, quite a crowd. Once again, outside of these officials, in other words, of the uh, scribes and Pharisees, those who were always following Jesus around, uh, there were the promiscuous multitude, the eager, the reverent, the curious, and the unbelieving. And the statement continues, different nationalities and all grades of society were represented. Number three, how did the spirit of the Pharisees contrast with that of the paralytic? We find in Desire of Ages, page 267, the answer. The spirit of life brooded over the assembly, but Pharisees and doctors, doctors means uh, the, the theological doctors, the PhDs of the, of the day, the spirit of life brooded over the assembly, but Pharisees and doctors did not discern its presence. They felt no sense of need, and the healing was not for them. In other words, present were, were the theologians and the Pharisees, the ministers of the day. They felt no need of Jesus. They felt rich and increased with goods and in need of absolutely nothing. They were like the rich young ruler. All of these things I have kept from my youth. What more do I still lack? They were like the Pharisee that went into the temple to pray along with the publican. I thank you, Lord, that I'm not like other men. I fast twice a week. I tithe of everything that I possess, I keep the Sabbath, I do all of these things. You know, they felt very self-sufficient. So there was no healing for them because they did not feel sick. There's nothing worse than a person who is sick and yet they don't admit that they're sick and do not seek healing for their illness. So uh, the Pharisees and the doctors did not really discern that the spirit of life was present at the assembly. Let's read the note. What a contrast between the paralytic and the Pharisees. He discerned the presence of the Holy Spirit and was healed. That is the paralytic. They, that is the Pharisees, rejected the work of the Holy Spirit and were hardened. Number four. Who suggested that the paralytic be let down from the roof? Well, Desire of Ages 268. At his suggestion, his friends bore him to the top of the house and breaking up the roof, let him down at the feet of Jesus. So notice that, that it's the paralytic's request. He says, you know, if it's necessary, we're not able to push through this crowd. There are too many people from all nationalities and all stripes of life. If I can't make it through, I'm not going to get healing. So he suggests, he says, let's break through the roof and come down to where Jesus is. This denotes tremendous faith on the part of this individual. So who suggested that the paralytic be let down from the roof? It says, at his suggestion, his friends bore him to the top of the house and breaking up the roof led him down at the feet of Jesus. Let's read the note. This man had a faith that was not to be denied. In spite of the apparently insurmountable obstacle of the crowd, he tenaciously sought 
without Jesus. And the lesson is that we must not allow anything to stand in the way of finding Jesus. Every effort must be made to find Jesus. Number five, who convicted the paralytic of his sin and when? The answer is in Desire of Ages, page 268. Jesus had drawn to himself that perplexed and doubting spirit. While the paralytic was yet at home, the Savior had brought conviction to his conscience. So notice that, you know, when the paralytic comes down from the roof, Jesus isn't surprised and say, wow, look, look at this paralytic coming down from the roof. No, Jesus had already wooed this paralytic while he was still at home, according to Desire of Ages, page 268. Let's read the note. In the Gospel of John, we find a, des a description of this attracting power of Jesus. It says in John chapter 12, verse 32, here Jesus is speaking, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. What he's saying is that if I am lifted up on the cross, when people behold me on the cross, I will draw them unto me. Just like this paralytic was drawn unto Jesus, and he put forth every effort to come to Jesus. Now let's talk about the healing of the paralytic. This is on page 272. The healing of the paralytic. So we've studied so far uh, the, the dire condition of the paralytic. We've studied the effort that he made to come to Jesus. And now we're going to notice the response of Jesus to this man's perseverance in finding his Savior. The question at the top of page 272, number one, is this. How did the paralytic feel when Jesus made the declaration, your sins are forgiven? Notice that Jesus does not heal him first. If he was concerned more about his physical healing, perhaps Jesus would have said, uh, you know, rise up and walk. And then he would have said, by the way, your sins are forgiven. No, but he knew that it was the remorse for sin that really tormented this man and had caused his physical illness. And so he goes to the root of his problem first before he physically heals him. So, how did the paralytic feel when Jesus made the declaration, your sins are forgiven? The answer is in Desire of Ages, page 268. The burden of despair rolls from the sick man's soul. The peace of forgiveness rests upon his spirit and shines out upon his countenance. So when Jesus says to him, your sins are forgiven, suddenly the expression on his face changes. The, his, his countenance shines according to Desire of Ages, page 268, because he has been relieved of the burden of sin in his life. Jesus has forgiven his sin. The Bible says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This man claimed the promise of forgiveness in Jesus. And the load of sin was removed from his heart. Next question, number two. How had the Pharisees responded to this man's cries? Desire of Ages 268. They recollected how the man had appealed to them for help. And they had refused him hope or sympathy. In other words, when Jesus says, your sins are forgiven to this man, immediately the religious leaders, they say, oh, we remember how he cried out to us for help, and we refused him help or any hope or sympathy. The statement continues, not satisfied with this, they had declared that he was suffering the curse of God for his sins. In other words, they, they not only ignored him, they not only did not provide any help, but they said, there's no hope for you. The curse of God is upon you because of your sins. Wow, what kind of religious leaders did they have in those days? Number three, what did the Pharisees fear most when Jesus healed this man? A Desire of Ages, page 268. They, they marked the interest with which all were watching the scene. And they felt a terrible fear 
of losing their own influence over the people. So when they saw Jesus heal this paralytic, they said, everybody's going to follow Jesus, and they're not going to follow us anymore. And uh, so we need to take measures to correct this. By the way, this came to a head when Jesus resurrected Lazarus. And, uh, you know, Caiaphas said the whole world has gone after him. And then the Sanhedrin met together and they said, uh, what can we do with this man? And Caiaphas says, it's necessary that one man die and not that the entire nation perish. So they were constantly, the religious leaders were constantly afraid of the influence of Jesus over the people that would take away their power over the people and bring uh, their allegiance to Jesus instead of to them. In fact, in Desire of Ages, page 205, this is not in the syllabus, I added it, uh, Ellen White explains that had it not been for the religious leaders of the day, the world would have experienced a revival such as never had been seen in its history. I read Desire of Ages 205. If the priests and rabbis had not interposed, his teaching would have wrought such a reformation as this world has ever witnessed. Wow. What would have happened if the religious leaders had accepted Jesus and said, we need to follow him, we need to, we need to uh, follow his counsel? There would have been this huge reformation such as the world has never seen. But the religious leaders actually opposed Jesus, whereas the multitudes were happy to sit at the feet of Jesus and listen to his teachings. Let's go to number four. How complete was this man's physical healing? I love the way that this is described. You know, it reminds me of the experience of when Naaman dipped into the Jordan seven times. It says that when he came out, this was an old warrior uh, in Syria. When he came out of the waters, it said that his, that his skin was like the sin, skin of a little child. In other words, he was really healed. He wasn't given the skin of the old man uh, that he was. He was given the skin like a child or a young, a young boy. So how complete was this man's physical healing? Desire of Ages 269. Then he who had been born on a litter to Jesus rises to his feet with the elasticity and strength of youth. So now he's elastic. The life-giving blood bounds through his veins. Every organ of his body springs into sudden activity. The glow of health succeeds the pallor of approaching death. So not only is there a radiance on his face, but also now his, his legs are elastic and he jumps up and he walks. Every organ of his body is now working, according to Desire of Ages, page 269. Not only did Jesus heal his soul, but after healing his soul, he healed his body as well. Number five, mid, mid, uh, middle of page 272. By whose power was the paralytic healed? Desire of Ages, page 269. It required nothing less than creative power to restore health to that decaying body. So notice that that which healed the paralytic was creative power. The same voice that spoke life to man, created from the dust of the earth, had spoken life to the dying paralytic. Wow! The same voice that spoke life to man, created from the dust of the earth, had spoken life to the dying paralytic. And then comes the promise, and the same power that gave life to the body had renewed the heart. This reminds me of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, where the Apostle Paul explains what happens to an individual who receives Christ into his or her life. It says there, Therefore, if any one is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. In other words, when a person accepts Jesus Christ, it takes as much power as the creation of the world. It takes the creative power of God to recreate a human heart into the image of Jesus Christ. Now let's go to question number six. 
What does Ellen White say concerning the psychosomatic link between physical and spiritual illness? You know, um, the Bible and modern science teaches us that our feelings and our emotions can have a role in healing us or making us sick. In other words, the mind has great power over the body. If a person thinks all the time in negative terms, the defenses of the body are lowered and the individual is more prone to get ill. Now let's read Desire of Ages, page 270. The spiritual healing was followed by physical restoration. Speaking of the paralytic, this lesson should not be overlooked. There are today thousands suffering from physical disease who, like the paralytic, are longing for the message, Thy sins are forgiven. The burden of sin, with its unrest and unsatisfied desires, is the foundation of their maladies. So notice, that's important. The burden of sin, with its unrest and unsatisfied desires, is the foundation of their maladies. In other words, their physical illness is due to their spiritual illness. The statement continues, They can find no relief until they come to the healer of the soul. The peace which he alone can give would impart vigor to the mind and health to the body. So when we come to Jesus, we not only receive healing of the soul, we receive also healing of our physical nature when we follow the laws of health that God has provided, that God has given. Now question number seven, at the bottom of page 272, how does Ellen White describe the intimate link between our physical and spiritual natures? You know, there are those today who say that there are two of us. There's the physical being, and then there's a soul inside the physical being. And when a person dies, the soul flies out of the body and can continue an independent existence from the body. And so the, the end result is that many people say, well, I need to take care of my soul. I don't really need to take care of my body because my body eventually is going to go to the grave anyway. And so what I need to do is uh, study the Bible and I need to pray and I need to witness to others, you know, uh, edify my spiritual nature. I don't have to worry about the physical habits that I practice. But the fact is that our physical habits have an impact upon our spiritual life. And our spiritual life has an impact upon our physical bodies. Notice the answer to this question. How does Ellen White describe the intimate link between our physical and spiritual natures? This is a powerful statement. Child Guidance, page 360. And incidentally, in the syllabus, uh, the statement is not completed. But I'm going to complete the statement. This is it. Since the mind and the soul find expression through the body, so notice this is important, since the mind and the soul find expression through the body, both mental and spiritual vigor are in great degree dependent upon physical strength and activity. Whatever promotes, and here's where I need uh, to complete the statement, what, uh, whatever promotes physical health promotes the development of a strong mind and a well-balanced character. Without health, no one can as distinctly understand or as completely fulfill his obligations to himself, to his fellow beings, or to his Creator. Therefore, the health should be as faithfully guarded as the character. A knowledge of physiology and hygiene should be the basis of all educational effort. A healthy mind in a healthy body. Because the attitude of our mind has an impact on our body. When we live with remorse, when we live with negative feelings and attitudes, that impacts our physical health. And of course, our physical health impacts the capacity of our minds to grasp spiritual truth and to have a connection with Jesus Christ as our Savior, as our personal friend. Now let's go to number 8 at the bottom of page 272. What effect did this healing have upon the Pharisees? 
Well, you know, the, the paralytic, he was overjoyed. He picked up his bed and he walked away. Maybe probably he jumped away or ran away because he, he had not only been physically healed, but the burden of sin had been removed, removed from his heart. But how did the Pharisees react? This is found in Desire of Ages, page 270. They were disconcerted and abashed, recognizing but not confessing the presence of a superior being. The stronger the evidence that Jesus had power on earth to forgive sins, the more firmly they entrenched themselves in unbelief. See, people can react in two ways to Jesus. They can become hardened in unbelief in the presence of Jesus, or their hearts can be melted in the presence of Jesus and they can benefit from spiritual healing. The statement continues, From the home of Peter, where they had seen the paralytic restored by his word, they went away to invent new schemes for silencing the Son of God. And these were the religious experts of the day of Christ. These were the ministers and the theologians. And let me just make an appeal here. Unfortunately, in the religious world today, the multitudes that attend the churches have almost blind trust in their religious leaders. What their religious leaders say, they consider to be gospel truth. And they don't investigate things in the scriptures for themselves to see if what their ministers say is true. You say, well, they're great spiritual leaders, so we can trust what they say. You know, it reminds me of the Bereans where we're told that the Bereans were more noble than those who were at Thessalonica. Because when the Apostle Paul preached, those in Berea checked in the scriptures what Paul was teaching to see if what he had said was in harmony with the scriptures. In other words, they did not even uh, believe uh, what the Apostle Paul said without going to the scriptures to confirm that what he said was in harmony with God's Word. In this case, it would be with the Old Testament. In other words, today, we need to be very careful that we do not follow simply what somebody says because we like that person, because, you know, that person is our pastor or our theologian or a scholar. We can only follow what we study for ourselves in the Holy Scriptures. Now, let's notice number nine. This is page 273. What is ever more terrible than physical disease? Desire of Ages, page 271. Physical disease, however malignant and deep-seated, was healed by the power of Christ. But the disease of the soul took a firmer hold upon those who closed their eyes against the light. Leprosy and palsy were not so terrible as bigotry and unbelief. An amazing statement. Once again, leprosy and palsy were not so terrible as bigotry and unbelief. Let's go to question number 10. How does Ellen White describe the complete physical healing of this man? This is Desire of Ages, page 271. He stood before them in the full vigor of manhood. Those arms that they had seen lifeless were quick to obey his will. The flesh that had been shrunken and leaden hued was now fresh and ruddy. He walked with a firm, free step. Joy and hope were written in every lineament of his countenance, and an expression of purity and peace had taken the place of the marks of sin and suffering. And undoubtedly, people could see the difference in him. Not only was he walking, this was amazing, but they saw radiance in his face, a joy in his life that they had not seen before. Depression left, and now the joy of Christ was in his heart. Number 11, 
This is on page 273. It's the last question, and then I'm going to make some comments, some additional comments in a few moments. What effect did the healing of the paralytic have upon his family? Desire of Ages, page 271. This man and his family were ready to lay down their lives for Jesus. No doubt dimmed their faith. No unbelief marred their fealty to Him who had brought light into their darkened home. So in other words, this man and his family, they said, we will be loyal to Jesus even at the cost of our lives. They came to love Jesus as their Savior and as their friend. Now before we bring this to an end, I would like us to look up some texts that we find in Scripture. You see, the healing of the paralytic by Jesus, of this physical paralysis, has a vital lesson for us who are living now in the 21st century. You see, the paralysis that we suffer is the paralysis of sin and guilt and shame. That's what we need to be especially delivered from. It does not allow us to walk spiritually. Now what does it mean to walk in a spiritual sense? Well, go with me to 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6. And what I want us to notice here is that when the Bible uses the word walk in a figurative sense or in a spiritual sense, it has to do with our conduct or our behavior in our lives. So in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6, we find these well-known words. He who says he abides in him, that is in Jesus, ought himself also to walk just as he walked. So you'll notice that walk here is not talking about physical walking. It's talking about doing as Jesus did, behaving as Jesus did, that our conduct would be like the conduct of Jesus. That's what walk means in a spiritual, figurative sense. So Jesus is saying that if anyone is in Him, we should walk or our conduct, our behavior should be like the behavior or the conduct of Jesus. We must walk as Jesus walked. But we cannot walk while we are paralyzed by sin. So in other words, Jesus has to place the healing touch upon us and restore our spiritual legs so that we can walk as He has walked. There's nothing, nothing worse than a person who is living in sin trying to walk uh, spiritually when he has or she has the burden of sin in the life. First of all, the person has to be healed by the touch of Jesus Christ so that the person can walk as Jesus walked. Let's read a couple of passages in closing. Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 1 to 3. Once again, the idea of walking. You know, we need to come to Jesus to have our spiritual legs repaired, and then when that happens, we will be able to walk as Jesus walked. Our behavior or our conduct will be like the conduct or behavior of Jesus. Notice Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 1 to 3. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3 uh, tells us. Uh, what walking means in a figurative sense. It says there, beginning at verse 1, And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked. So notice, people once walked in sin. That's spiritually speaking. In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves, see that the walking is conduct, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, wrath just as the others. So notice when we're outside of Jesus, our conduct is impacted. We're sons of disobedience. Uh, we walk in the desires of the flesh and of the mind. By nature, we're children of wrath. We need to come to Jesus for Jesus to heal our spiritual legs so that we can walk even as He walks. 
Let's go to Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 9. This is the last passage that we're going to take a look at in our study today. Colossians chapter 3 and verses 5 through 9. It says there, Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. And then he says about the Colossians, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. Notice, you walked in this sinful lifestyle before you came to Jesus. But now comes the comforting news. Verse 8, but now you yourselves are to put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language, out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Where there is neither Jew, Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all in all. So you notice the Apostle Paul makes this long list of sins that those outside of Christ commit. And then he says to the Colossians, but now you yourselves are to put off all of these. And then he gives a list of the things that should be put off. So in this beautiful story of the healing of the paralytic, Jesus wants to teach us many spiritual lessons about deliverance from sin. Let's notice uh, in closing the book of Romans, the book of Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 and verses 22 and 23. But now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So if you are walking outside of Jesus in the sins of the flesh, like the sons of disobedience, Jesus invites you to come to Him, that He might heal you, that He might remove the burden of guilt from your soul, and you might walk even as Jesus walked, that your life and your conduct will reflect your new relationship with Jesus, and people might see a new radiance in your face, face and a new and total commitment to Jesus Christ as your Savior and as your Lord. May this be our experience as we finish this lesson.